Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here for this last panel. I realize that we are holding up between this and the rest of the networking, so we're going to make it a really good end to the evening. Thank you to David and the entire All Tech is Human team for having us. We're, we're super excited to be here today. So my name is Camille. Um, I'm a senior policy manager for the Center for Humane Technology. Today we're going to talk about digital spaces and public goods. And I think that the premise of this panel is really about the fact that kind of the internet has come to be the main resources for us to access government services, educational material, serve as an advocacy tool, build coalitions, provide public goods. And as a result, the internet and digital spaces have come to influence our civic lives in ways that we might not even understand. Yet the elephant in the room is that many of the digital spaces we utilize for civic interactions and for civic engagement are not public. They are held by powerful companies with limited transparency and accountability mechanisms. So today, we're really excited to talk about how we can actually create and expand healthy digital public spaces. We're going to look at best practices, how to realign profit incentives, and in particular, we're gonna focus on how to create healthy digital spaces for all current and future current and future users, especially those from the global majority. Finally, we're going to offer ways for everyone here in the room to get involved. So with that, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists. First, we have Theodora Sudeikis. Theo is, thank you. Theo is the Deputy Director of Strategy for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Technology. Theo has 10 years of public policy experience at the intersection of technology, society, and safety, where she's worked for a range of stakeholders, including Twitter's global public policy team, the National Democratic Institute, and the Committee to Protect Journalists. Next, we have Shabanas Rashid Dia. Hi. Dia is the founder and executive director of Tech Global Institute. Dia has spent the last two decades working at the intersection of technology, global development, economic policy, including it as head of public policy at Meta. She has advised and worked with governments in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, South Africa, Nigeria, and the US on digital inclusion, data economics, and tech regulation. Next, we have Sinead Bovell. Sinead is a futurist. Sinead is a futurist and the founder of Way, a tech education company that prepares youth for the future of work and life with advanced technologies, with a focus on non-traditional and minority markets. She also serves as the Generation Connect Visionaries board member for the International Telecommunications Union. Sinead's work focuses on how to use foresight and proactively engage with technology in a positive way as our societies evolve. Last but not least, we have Patrick Lynn. Patrick is an author, researcher, and lawyer focused on artificial intelligence, privacy law, copyright law, and technology policy and regulation. Previously, he worked for the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, the FTC, and EFF, among others. Patrick is the author of Machine See, Machine Do, an approachable and informative book about technology policy and the criminal legal system. And with that, if we can give the panelists another round of applause, we'll dive in. So I would love us to start by making, painting the picture for people in the room. In your perspective, what are the factors that influence whether or not our digital public spaces are positive or negative influences on civic engagement? And can you also provide a few examples for people? Theo, do you want to take this first? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's great to see so many friends here. Um, so there are so many ways in which our digital spaces are made more or less inclusive for folks all over the world. Uh, I'll just give one set of examples from one of my earlier experiences. I worked at Twitter for a few years where I uh, managed and was involved in a few different projects. So I managed the day-to-day -day operations of our Trust and Safety Council. It was a, yeah, I see a few of our members here, um, which is really nice, but it, it managed or 
We um, realized that uh, as we were developing new products and policies, it was very important to bring in diverse expert perspectives from civil society globally. And so we had a series of advisory groups that informed us on product developments like Twitter spaces, Twitter communities, um, and also customization and curation decisions in product um, that allowed users to create safer experiences for themselves and on our policies, like our hateful conduct policy, our crisis misinformation policy. Um, and I also managed a trusted partners program for human rights defender, human rights defenders globally, as well as journalists to help them uh, be prioritized in our queues so that as they were experiencing issues, because they're very vulnerable populations, uh, they could receive faster uh, response to issues like impersonation and fraud and abuse. Um, this was something that we relied very heavily on during, for example, the protests in Iran last year as folks were getting apprehended by the Iranian government. Uh, we regularly leveraged this helpline for human rights defenders to immediately freeze their accounts when they were taken in by government to prevent additional abuse. Um, and I also managed a research hub for the public policy team, because I technically sat in public policy, where we were trying to introduce insights from expert researchers around the world by creating a pipeline of research to be shared with our trust and safety teams so that we could better understand the insights and be in conversation with researchers um, so that we could then reflect on the insights that they were generating and self-govern more effectively by creating healthier products and policies. And, and last, I was involved in something called the Twitter Moderation Research Consortium. This was a global network of independent researchers where we were sharing takedown data uh, on state-backed information operations with researchers at institutions all around the world so that they could better do research and that we could better understand from, from the research that they were doing how malicious actors were leveraging um, Twitter to advance certain narratives. Unfortunately, all of these uh, programs have been dismantled. None of these are operational anymore. And so all of these teams got uh, dismantled. And, um, and so it really brings home the point that's been mentioned in a few of these conversations that um, it takes people, um, people on the inside and people on the outside to do this work together because it wasn't just us on the inside, it was us working really closely with civil society and researcher partners all over the world um, to leverage the expertise that they had so that we could deliver uh, healthier and more inclusive spaces. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the big things we all heard from that was collaboration between those within tech and researchers. Patrick, I'm curious, as a researcher, writer, lawyer, if you also have some perspectives on the factors that influence what makes good and kind of negative digital public spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to the degree of um, degree to which um, the digital platform gives users the ability to control um, and own their own experience. Um, you know, I think from a design perspective, you really have to bring it down to the user level, right? It's, are you... Are you thinking about what the user experience is like? Um, are you making sure that you're transparent and, and forthcoming about um, you know, how your data is being used, how users' data is being used? Um, are those things you know, not just hidden away in a privacy policy, but are those actually readable and, and understandable to the average user? Um, and at the end of the day, um, do users also have the ability to control to what extent that data is being used, how it's being targeted? Um, what advertising they're receiving. Can they also control who they're interacting with on this platform? Um, do they have the ability to block people who have harassed them? Do they have the ability to um, focus their experience and curate their experience to just seeing the content that they're the most interested in um, and content that might be, will not offend them or will not uh, bring harm to them in, in different ways? And so um, I really see it as coming down to whether the user has control and, and ownership over their experience on that platform. Um, and that allows them to engage with um, other users and with the larger society in the way that they feel is um, the most productive for them and, and safest and most comfortable for them. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think what we're hearing is that there's actually a lot of solutions out there. And so then that poses the question, why, why are the solutions not being implemented? So why have time and time again, we see, you know, whether it's with social media or now emerging technologies, that market incentives are driving these choices that are actually harmful to users and harmful to society. Are there ways that we can start to shift these incentives and you know start creating these spaces in a way that's more democratic and more beneficial? Um, maybe Sinead, do you want to start with this? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think whose incentives we prioritize really do matter. 
Uh, and I think it is important to really drive home the point that even though these spaces um, have an outsized impact on our political, economic, social ecosystems, they are first and foremost private companies. Uh, this is, you know, Facebook, Twitter, they're not the town square. Um, they're not akin to you know, the library. They're actually much more structurally similar to McDonald's. Uh, and so in, in terms of incentives, on the, on the one hand, if we do think that these places have this, of, this type of outsized impact, uh, the conversation steers a little bit towards one that looks like what the railroad look like uh, than it does uh, in terms of you know, advocating for their rights. In terms of actual incentives, I do not think it actually, you have to be inherently at odds when it comes to driving a fiduciary duty to shareholders uh, and aligning that with public interest uh, and over and above what can we do to make that alignment. I would say first and foremost, optimization on, on the actual platform. So when we look at what makes these platforms uh, so toxic uh, and so disruptive to society, it's that the optimization functions are for uh, divisive content, for enragement, uh, and this is kind of what has led to a lot of the problems that we've talked about here today. But optimizing for enragement and engagement isn't the only function that works. Uh, it's just the main function that's been utilized. Uh, and so there are other potential solutions, such as bridging-based systems, uh, where instead of optimizing for people what they don't have in common um, and what they're likely going to get enraged about, you find groups with mutual that have mutual understandings that seem like they would have been at odds, but they actually share things uh, that aren't as obvious. So they might like similar posts in the background, uh, but usually those are ranked down. If we optimize for things like bridging based systems, that would be brought up. And we've seen this work successfully uh, with Twitter. So I don't know if you're familiar with community notes in Twitter. And it's kind of like this amazing micro use case uh, of a different way to organize social media. And so how community notes work, if, if you see misleading or harmful content, you can write a community note. And the notes that get brought to the top are the ones that have the most amount of votes from the most divert, from people with kind of different data profiles or different data backgrounds. Uh, so I think we can incentivize that would also create a better online experience, uh, would be more attractive for advertisers and also keep people on the platform. So I think that that's one way that you can align. Uh, and then a second way, again, if you want to really align with platforms to driving shareholder value, um, is to take topics like misinformation and disinformation actually off of their plate um, and adopt that in the public by doing things like mini publics or citizen assemblies. Uh, so instead of when it comes to these really massive decisions that actually aren't technical decisions, they're social decisions, uh, taking that away from the private sector because they have such a uh, widespread impact uh, and instead making that decision as a public. And so if you're not familiar with what a citizen's assembly is uh, or a mini public, uh, you take statistical representative samples of the population, uh, kind of similar to a jury, uh, and you have them deliberate and decide on behalf of the public, this is what we think uh, we should do when it comes to misinformation or disinformation. Um, and again, I think that that's a way to align the public interest uh, with the interests of the private sector. Um, but I think at the end of the day, even if we can't incentivize them financially because their first and foremost, their duty is to, to shareholder value. You're not a, a public, you don't have a right to exist inherently uh, in a way that causes harm. So at the end of the day, we wouldn't let a, a car manufacturer produce cars but without brakes. If things aren't working, um, it shouldn't matter if we can incentivize them or not. We should just be able to regulate against that if it is causing harm. Yeah, I saw some big... Um nodding of your head into that. Do you want to add? No, I was really intrigued with the McDonald's example because that's a good one. And I think that's fundamentally where we need to start is to recognize that platforms and technology companies in general, I mean, we see them as a global social good in many ways, a global public good, but they're really private sector companies. And so the right analogy for them is, you know, they're like McDonald's and, they're, and it's a franchising model in, in many ways and many ways not. And so the same way, you know, we wouldn't, I mean, and I think it's it's in the sense that, um, you know, the way if McDonald's entering a new market, they're going to like, for example, change one thing here, one thing there, and then they're ready for a new market. I think technology companies often tend to do the same, have the same approach entering new markets. But I think that fundamentally needs to change because technology touches us in such a deeply personal, emotional way, as we heard this morning from many of the speakers today. So I think in terms of incentive structures, I think like as a way forward, maybe there's probably three ways you can kind of break it, right? So I think about it in terms of 
market, companies, people, not in that order, of course, people comes first, but uh, in terms of, you know, if you're thinking about markets, how are the market incentives that are driving a company to kind of expand, uh, think about its resourcing? And I think the same way companies do their A-B testing on new product launches, right? So they decide, you know, is this product good or bad in terms of adoption rate, uh, you know, rate of, uh, rate of adoption, um, adoption rate or number of users or demography that's that are actually going to use that product. I think there should be A-B testing for product safety. And you shouldn't be launching a product unless and until it's actually safe for an audience. And I think a really good example of that, um, and, especially, and, and I think there's an incentive structure there because these companies want to expand to new markets. They want to be international. Um, so if you're trying to enter a new market like Korea, India, which are very large markets in terms of just user bases, and that does drive shareholder value, then maybe think about what are the preconditions that you need in order to enter a new market. And I think a good example of that is the way uh, when Suzuki entered India back in the 1980s. So the deal that Suzuki had struck with Maruti, which is a local company in India, was that in order to enter that market, they have to make cars that are fit for the, for the typical average Indian family. And that average Indian family is, five, is a five-person family. They have an elderly parent, which means it has to be lowered down. So the, the gap between you know, where you exit the car and the road has to be much, much smaller. And so things like that would actually made the new brand of Maruki Suzuki much better for the Indian market. It wasn't just a Suzuki replica in the Indian market. So I think in that way, perhaps product safety needs to have a bit of that A-B testing happening in that market. The second part of that, I think, is in terms of the business model. So everybody here talks a lot about the business model, but I think often as when we get caught up into arguments around Section 230 in the US, it becomes very much about a re remove versus keep debate, which is a very binary debate. But from my vantage point, being in the platform, being outside the platform, I think a lot of it is dependent on the design of the platform. And there's some really great work done by uh, Hany Farid at Berkeley that talks about how YouTube's recommender systems operate and how a small tweak in the design could actually reduce misinformation and terrorist crime by a significant amount. So it is actually possible, but it's possible when regulations are actually at the design level as opposed to at the content level, which still continues to be the case in many parts of the world. And, I'm, uh, and the last part of that, I think, is around process. And I think we around process and people, which is what we heard this morning from the Canadian government around Citizen Assembly, which is a really great process. But process and people are really important because oftentimes this is incentive model structure. I mean, companies are not really incent incentivized to talk to uh, low-income people, marginalized people. But I do think there has to be a process built around it and institutionalized of that process where whether it's a law externally or a platform policy internally, there is a process built around to make sure that you have people's voices, that there is a process built around proper consultations. And I think this is particularly important when we think about legislations in less mature democracies where that process is being institutionalized and that becomes part of how companies operate in different markets. Yeah, I think that leads us really nicely into our next question about what really is the role of regulation in driving these healthy digital public spaces and not just what is the role, but what are some important principles that we should be really honing in on when it comes to establishing regulation? Patrick, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, and it sounds like we're all somewhat on the same page here. I think regulation is kind of the most essential piece of this puzzle. I think um, there's a big reputational approach to incentivizing uh, these companies to act better and to, in, uh, you know, implement new practices, right? We can shame them. We can be more aware of what their policy policies are and their practices. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we can't really count on these private actors to act altruistically and to, um, you know, prioritize, um, you know, user safety and health. Um, and so at the end of the day, I do think regulation is sort of the, the final stage of this. And as to how we approach it regulation, I think um, a lot of attempts have been made through sort of like the controlling content, content moderation, Section 230, First Amendment. These are all sort of the approaches that, um, you know, private class actions have tried to take, regulators, Congress um, has tried to take. Um, and these have kind of proven to be really effective shields for these companies to be able to hide behind, right? Where, you know, no matter which side of the political spectrum you're on, the First Amendment is such a touchy topic and something that we view as very sacred. Um, Section 230 is also something that, again, both sides of the aisle have their own sort of agendas when it comes to how we control and um, how we uh, change content and moderate content. Um, but I think, um, and something this is uh, other panels have sort of alluded to as well, 
is really taking more of actually a consumer protection or even a products liability approach to it. Um, I think that's um, a space that hasn't been explored enough yet. Um, you know, when Facebook says that they will handle your data in a certain way and that they'll take a certain level of care with your data and making sure that they're not just willy-nilly selling you know, your information to advertising firms, marketing firms, um, are they actually doing that? Or is that false advertising, right? Um, I think taking that false advertising approach um, is one way to um, to regulate these companies. If um, you know a certain social media company says, if you have been harassed or if you've experienced some sort of hate speech on our platform, and you provide a means for this user, this victim, to be able to reach out to your company, but then you don't, there's no follow through, right? You don't actually do anything to address it. You don't actually, um, you know, try to remedy the situation. Um, is that also a failure of your product, right? You're you're putting out this uh, the fact that you are trying to create a safe environment for your users. You are providing them with a means of filing complaints, but then you're not doing anything about it, right? And so, is there grounds for a user in that situation to say, "Well, you you've gotten me onto your platform, and you've made me feel safe, but you're not actually doing anything to follow through on that." Um, and so that's where consumer protection, I think, is a really um, effective way of doing that. And actually, I think of all the government agencies that we have that are actually sort of, I think, spearheading this is really the FTC. Um, in 2019, for example, um, the FTC uh, imposed a $5 billion like historic uh, penalty on Facebook. I think to this day, it's still the highest penalty the agency has ever imposed. Um, but while that's a huge penalty, um, I think the more more interesting piece of it is actually they also imposed um, certain requirements and changes that Facebook had to actually um, implement within a certain period of time. So things like changing uh, the way they handle your data um, and also having oversight over um, different privacy practices and the way data leaves uh, Facebook to third parties and how third parties have access to the data that Facebook is supposedly um, you know, a steward of in some way. Um, and so that's just one example, but I think that sort of consumer protection approach is really um, a new and different way of approaching, um, you know, liability and, and sort of reining in social media companies um, and other providers of these uh, these public spaces online. So I would love to dig into this just a little bit more to make it super clear for the audience, because what you're saying about this consumer protection approach and Dia, what you were saying about content moderation versus design and where regulation kind of you know comes in, it's really important in terms of actually how we can get things past within the U.S. So if either one of you want to just kind of speak to these different approaches and why looking at consumer protection and why looking at design is more fruitful, that would be fantastic. I'm um, sure, yeah, I can, I can um, elaborate on that a little bit more. I think um, things like free speech, um, content moderation, I think um, those are sort of more, uh, I think the word I'm thinking of here is almost like philosophical. It's a bit more of a conceptual thing. And so it's more nebulous. People have different ideas of what that means for them, right? Um, whether your free speech is being infringed upon, that looks very different from different groups of people. Um, but I think for consumer protection, that really brings the experience down to the individual, right? You're saying, well, I've been harassed. Um, I've filed complaints and nothing's been done. Or, um, well, the terms of service say that, you know, this company will handle my data in a certain way. And that clearly was not the case. Um, they're selling my data, or there was a data breach of some sort, things like that. Like the the cybersecurity practices are not up to snuff, um, and so that again, I think, brings it down to an individual level. It's a lot more of a tangible harm too, um, and that's why I think it's a maybe a more effective way to go about um, regulating. Yeah, I can build on that. I think um, I mean we talk a lot about the U.S. Maybe I can give a bit of an international spin to that and talk a little bit about how this would work in other countries. So I think. And if you think about regulations and how to make regulations effective and what are the fundamental principles around it, I think first and foremost, it's really important to situate sort of how the world's internet population is divided. So 5.3 billion, uh, there's 5.3 billion around the world, but of that 3.9 billion are actually situated in low and middle income countries. They're not in the US, they're not in the EU, they're not in Australia. They're everywhere else, right? So it's really important to situate that when we talk about regulations from an international governance standpoint and what that means for a US regulation, a EU regulation, what, and what is their impact in other parts of the world. So that being said, I think it's also critical to recognize that regulations are not really exportable materials. You can not just, you know, plug and play regulations from one country to another. And I think oftentimes that is the approach of the regulation that people have taken. 
And that leads to a lot of conundrums, a lot of uh, ineffectiveness. So if we talk a lot about this today about Digital Services Act, uh, which is a great law for, for the EU because EU has rule of law, it has human rights principles embedded in it, which if we, have, if we apply the exact same provisions to a country like Vietnam, which has an authoritarian government, giving researcher access to data is a very, very problematic thing. And that's actually going to seriously um, deter democratic movements in the country. A really tangible example of that is the NetsDG, which is the Network, Network Enforcement Act in Germany, which was created with a notice and take down regime. And the idea of that, uh, and that was, you know, propagated around the world as this new vision of controlling hate speech because hate speech was criminalized under that law. But that specific law then inspired 17 other countries to follow the exact same law, including Venezuela, Turkey, Russia, um, India, Malaysia. And when in that context, something like Network Enforcement Act and the criminalization of hate speech happens, who, what do you actually categorize as hate speech? There's no universal definition around it. So essentially, those laws were abused in other contexts to actually target political dissent. So it's really important to think about that kind of fundamental values misalignment when you're thinking about regulatory approaches. So that's, I think, the starting point. The second is, how do you actually get over it, right? And I think that's where international human rights law really plays a critical role. But oftentimes when we talk about international human rights law, we talk about in the lens of Article 19, which is the freedom of expression. We don't talk about Article 3, which is before Article 19, which is about freedom, which is the right to stay safe, right? And I think that should that is oftentimes deprioritized. And I, and I think a lot of that is because platform policies inherently has been developed out of American case law, right? And American case law has a lot of it because it's so unique in that way and because First Amendment rights in the, in the U.S. is so unique in that way, when you have an entire global governance structure based entirely out of First Amendment principles that does start kind of falling apart in other parts of the world. So I think it's important when you base international human rights law as a platform policy structure, it's important to do it from a safety and expression perspective. It's not one or the other, it's actually both. And I think the last thing I'm going to say is largely around... so. If, if we were to create, I mean, I mean, I don't want it to be all gloom and doom and gloom that you know, there's no way to do it globally. I do think it's important to create global structures because of just how platforms operate and because they are global in nature. But I think a big part of that is to not instit institutionalize what the laws are, but rather what the processes are. And again, I will go back to the, I, I was really inspired by this morning's uh, panel around the Canadian experience around citizen assembly. I think that's a really Great way to talk about a bottom-up approach in how do you actually make good legislations. But there are other examples as well. And I think it's really critical that, you know, there are multilateral bodies like the UN who are now coming into content moderation spaces. You know, I've, I saw a paper from the DTSP, which is the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. There's something from the World Economic Forum. All of these larger international sort of bodies should be thinking about not you know, let's make CSAM bad and NCII bad because I don't think that fundamentally the definitions are same across the world, and they aren't. But rather, how do we actually streamline and institutionalize what process you follow in order to produce a regulation? Who do you talk to? Who is at the table? Do you, you have to do a multi stakeholder consultation? How do you do human rights due diligence? These are procedural safeguards you have to put in the development of regulations in order to make sure it works for the community it is aimed at and not just a plug and play structure, which is gonna, which I don't think fundamentally is gonna change platform behavior necessarily. And I think another really good example of that is, is GDPR. GDPR has not changed privacy for anyone in the world except Europeans. No one has better privacy because of GDPR. So I think it's important to recognize those gaps and then think about what structures could actually overcome those gaps. Yeah, definitely. I think that the context in which we're operating is one of the big, big takeaways from this. And I'm curious, Theo, from your experience, both working within platforms and now within government, are there some best practices that you see that are driving healthy digital public spaces in, in your experience? Definitely. So I think we build more inclusive spaces, healthier spaces, when we're engaging a more diverse body of organizations and people uh, in the process of designing and, and building out these spaces. So 
I can give one or two examples. Um, in the last few months, I've had the pleasure of working with the National Democratic Institute, and a few of our colleagues are here now, uh, where we were looking specifically at the issue of online gender-based violence and women's political participation. It's well documented that women, specifically women of color, uh, experience a wide range of online abuse, and that this has a very adverse impact on their willingness to participate uh, in the political space. So the connection between online and offline harm Arms is very stark. Uh, and so what we did was we looked at all of the reports that civil society has put out globally on this issue over the last five, 10 years. So all of the folks who are looking at this and put together a large database of all of their recommendations. So recommendations from civil society experts um, and then analyze them to see what recommendations are most frequently occurring. So we saw transparency, curation or customization and policy specific interventions as the ones that were most frequently occurring. And so these uh, civil society generated reports were done in consultation with independent researchers. Um, we as researchers in civil society uh, then took these reports and then met specifically with the companies that we were looking to target. So the companies that we thought were the most egregious um, uh, instances of abuse or where abuse takes place against women and where we thought the most positive effects could be had if if these interventions were implemented. So we did a series of consultations um, and, and tried to um, influence these companies to take seriously the concerns that civil society was generating and then published an op-ed in Tech Policy Press. And so we're able to influence or, or reach a larger audience so that the conversation was elevated in public consciousness. Um, and, and I'll say as someone who ran for public office, I ran for city council in 2021, I unfortunately also experienced um, online harm and it, it really did affect my thoughts about running again. I, I didn't win my campaign and um, I don't know that I would want to run again. Um, and, and in government, so I now work um, full-time in state government in Massachusetts, something that we do as we're thinking about our constituents, so the the residents of Massachusetts and the services that they're getting from government is, is looking to leverage insights from um, best practices in, in other states across the country. So we're regularly in conversation with other states. We're also in conversation with uh, nonprofits that are, are trying to introduce best practices and innovations into state government. And of course, we're in close contact with the constituents themselves, and in particular, the ones that are most vulnerable within the state. So I, I definitely think that um, cross-sector collaboration and conversation is critical in this in this effort. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think that what we're hearing is that there's a lot of lessons that that we're learning and that there's a lot of historical basis for what we're taking away. And I'm curious, um, Sinead, is there, you know, are there ways that we can really anticipate how these spaces are going to turn out? Are there ways that we can have foresight and design them better? Yeah, yeah, I think foresight is absolutely critical in all moments, but especially this one you know, that we stop and ask, where are we in this moment and where are the capabilities going? So I think we all um, understand what generative AI is and we kind of understand what are some of the changes that are coming down the pipeline uh, and how do we prepare for that? Our current the current structure of the internet and the current structure of digital spaces uh, doesn't have the capacity to absorb the potential challenges uh, that a world like generative AI will bring. Uh, so that means we need to move towards something that has more authentication in a world where uh, you can produce infinite uh, fake imagery, infinite fake content, uh, where bots can sometimes seem more human than humans themselves. Uh, the current version of digital spaces, the current version of the internet, uh, isn't going to suffice. So having enough, enough foresight to say we need to actually change the structure of these platforms and the structure of the internet to one of authentication, uh, one where humans get rights, uh, bots don't. Uh, and we have the authentication to be able to tell the difference between the two. And then in terms of what are the what's the low hanging fruit that we have in this moment? Uh, what isn't currently working on these platforms? We've seen things with like the nicotine generation and all the levers we pulled there uh, to bring out a healthier ecosystem. We can see the similarities in social media uh, with dopamine. I often say our parents were the nicotine generation and we're the dopamine generation. Uh, so how can we make certain design decisions uh, to make these spaces healthier? Uh, and then of course there's the zoomed out the zoomed out look at the markets and you can see there's already starting to be a shakeup in environments where it doesn't feel good. So the market is already starting to gear away from platforms that we no longer feel work for us or we no longer feel safe in. 
that's a much slower way to let the market kind of take its course. Uh, but you can see it's all moving in a direction of smaller, a bit more fragmented. Uh, but I think the, the most force that you should apply in this moment uh, is understanding how the technology is changing and how we need to insulate our infrastructure to prepare for what's on the horizon. Great, thanks. And then final question for each of you. I would love us to end on an actual note. So if you could each just provide one brief takeaway or one way that people could get involved, that would be great. Sure. So um, I'll suggest that folks write a bill. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly highlight my uh, experience in this space as a potential model for all of you. So I run a community-based nonprofit in Cambridge uh, where we support locally and independently owned businesses. And something that we've come to realize over the last 15 years is that small businesses are really suffering. Uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to start and thrive in small business ownership. And this is really problematic because for most Americans, historically, um, wealth building happened through small business ownership. That's how folks were able to come to the U.S. as immigrants and then um, elevate themselves socioeconomically was by um, engaging in the small business process. Or process. Um, unfortunately, it's become very difficult because of multi-decade bank consolidation, changes in consumer purchasing preferences as folks buy on Amazon instead of supporting small businesses, um, and also uh, rising rents that have displaced small businesses just like they've displaced uh, residents in cities. And so um, recognizing this, we've been working with a group of partners to write a bill in Massachusetts modeled off of the Minnesota and New York examples that came before us that haven't yet succeeded, but maybe are as well, um, that will try to um, work against abuse of dominance in Massachusetts so that uh, our attorney general has more power to um, inspect um businesses that are looking to consolidate and grow beyond competitive levels. And so uh, it's not so easy. I'm learning as I'm going, but folks can engage in the legislation process by speaking with your legislators about issues that you care about. They often want to hear from you because they don't have that knowledge themselves, speci specifically in tech, um, and, and also working with nonprofits to bring their collective expertise into the legislative process. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to build on what Theo has said. I think a big a thing that we can do as a community, this, this is a fairly informed community, is probably um, ask more, right? Demand more of the companies that you're using, the platforms that you're using, of your, the governments that you're voting for. I think when collectively people speak up and ask more of things, a lot of good things happen. But when you're asking for more, make sure as you're doing it, you're also challenging your own assumptions, right? And I think that's a really big part of it because... Um, this audience is already quite familiar with technology, but you know, when you're demanding more, are those just anecdotal? Is it more evidence-based? Is it actually working only for you? Does it work for a larger group of people? So think about those questions as you're demanding more, but definitely demand more because when, like when I was in a platform, the largest sort of, um, and I was in a public policy team, so my job basically was to evade bills. That's what I did uh, and kill bills essentially. So, um, Part of that process was basically we would go and say, but no one else is talking about it. So why is the government talking about it alone? So I think with that public consensus, that public energy is really critical to making things move and happen uh, and make things different. So ask more. Yeah, I would say insert yourself in the conversations that matter to you. There is no prerequisite or resume required for a conversation about a future that's going to involve you. Uh, and, you know, regardless of what you believe to be true about the future and what you've heard today, the absolute best thing we can do is prepare for it. So try not to unsubscribe uh, from these conversations, from these processes, and know that you have every right to be in a room that involves your future. Um, I would say do not settle, um, you know, for any action that is less than what you deserve as, as a human being. Um, you know, when our governments pass or, or propose things like the AI Bill of Rights, which sounds really great like the bill of rights has all this enforceable you know uh power and it's it's a rule of law but um it's really just a series of recommendations for what companies can do and it's a bunch of suggestions um when companies say well we'll provide you with a a family center or or some sort of um you know secondary function that allows for you to have a little bit more control over your experience but not everything and and it there, there's the use of dark patterns to control how long you stay on these applications. Don't settle for that. Don't let them outsource their accountability to you because the onus does ultimately fall 
on these platforms to create a safer and more trustworthy environment for you as a user. Um, so don't settle and um, continue advocating for regulation because I think that's really the only way that any of this actually changes. Um, we can't count on the, the altruism of companies to change to our benefit, um, but I don't think engagement um, and, and safety have to be mutually exclusive either. Thank you all. What a great way to end. And thank you to the audience. And again, All Tech is Human for having us. Thank you.